Okay. So the final point I want to talk about is what evidence do we have for the Lorentz transformation? Okay, so, so far, as I said, the evidentiary basis is quite weak. All I've talked about is the michelson morley experiment and the stellar aberration experiments. Okay? And it passes that test, so you can explain those experiments, but you'd like to be able to do a direct test of these effects. Right? I haven't given you any evidence that these things actually happen directly. Right? We've only got some indirect evidence that they can explain the michelson morley and aberration effects. Okay. So these days, we can do direct tests of these. Okay? So for example, in the 60s, there was an experiment done where they took two atomic clocks, which are very, very accurate clocks. They left one of them on the ground, and they put another one on an aeroplane and, and went around the Earth. Okay? And therefore, as long as you're going in the same direction the Earth is rotating, the aeroplane is going relatively faster than the clock on the Earth, and therefore it should measure less time. Okay? So that's a direct measurement of time dilation effect, and indeed they found it did agree. Okay? But that was in the 1960s. Before that, um, it's hard to do direct measurements of these things, because as I said, the gamma factor only becomes significant at very, very high velocities. Um, so, it took a while for evidence, direct evidence for the Lorentz transformation to appear. So, for the rest of this class, then, I want to talk about one piece of experimental evidence. So, one experiment you can do to test the Lorentz transformation. And later on in the course, we'll see a few more pieces of evidence. And also, for the student presentations, some of those are about tests of the Lorentz transformation as well. Okay, so the one I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to show a PPT. This is measuring time dilation of muon decay rates. So, before I show you the PPT, let me briefly say something about this. So, we said the time dilation effect is that if you take a moving clock, then it will seem to run slower than a stationary clock. Okay? But here it's important to realize when we say clock, we're not just talking about you know, watches or you know, your phone or something. You're not just talking about things that we call clocks. You're talking about any process which can be used to measure time. So, for example, I could take how long does it take for this pen to fall down, right? I could use that as a clock, right? Does it take one second or two seconds or three seconds, right? That could be a clock. You could take the speed of electrical processes in your brain as a clock as well, okay? So, basically, any physical process which has a characteristic time scale can be taken as a clock. And time dilation says that all of these things slow down, okay? So, it's not just watches and, you know, things that we usually call clocks which slow down. It's all physical processes which slow down, okay? Um, and actually, this is required by the principle of relativity, because if, if some things slowed down and some things didn't, then by looking at the difference between the two, you would be able to tell that you're moving, okay? And the principle of relativity says you can't tell you're moving. So therefore, if one process slows down, all of the processes slow down. From the perspective of the S observer, the S prime clock is going slowly, but the S prime's brain is also going slowly. Okay? So he doesn't notice that his clock is going slowly because his brain is also going slowly from the perspective of this observer. Okay. Right. So, therefore, by clock, we can use anything which has a characteristic time scale. Okay? And what this experiment does is measure the decay rates of muons. Muons are a particular kind of subatomic particle. Okay, they are unstable. That means if you just take a move muon and leave it there, then after a certain period in time it will decay. It will change into other particles. Okay? And this decay rate has a characteristic time scale. Okay? So therefore, moving muons, according to the time dilation effect, 
moving muons should decay more slowly. And this is the effect which is measured in this experiment. Okay, so. Okay, so the experiment, I'm going to show you a video of it at the end of the class. Um, it uses muons which are created in the atmosphere. So there are lots of sources of very high energy radiation in the universe, and when some of this high energy radiation enters our atmosphere, it can create exotic kinds of particles. Okay? And one of the kinds of particles that can be created is this mu plus, which is a positive muon. And these are the focus of this experiment. Okay? So they're created high up in the atmosphere by these high energy cosmic rays. Um, they travel very close to the speed of light, and they travel, well, they travel in all directions, but some of them travel down from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of the Earth. Okay. So therefore, it's possible to detect these muons in a laboratory on the Earth. Okay, okay so I told you they have a characteristic time scale on which they decay. So this is known as the decay rate. If you take a population of muons, and here capital N is the number of muons you have, okay, then the number of muons that will be left after a time t is equal to the original population times an exponential factor like this. Okay. So if I draw a graph of that, So you start out with n0 muons, and then it decays exponentially. Looks something like this. Okay. So more and more muons are decaying as time goes on. So this process can be characterized by a decay rate, which tells you how fast this exponential decays. Okay. And here, for muons, this parameter tor is about 2.2 millionths of a second. Okay. And that's when they are stationary. So according to um, the time dilation effect, if these muons are moving, then they should last longer. Okay? Because their time, their clocks will be time dilated. So therefore they decay more slowly. Okay. Now, if there was no time dilation effect, and these muons were traveling at the speed of light, then the total distance they can travel, x, is just equal to their speed times the amount of time they live, right? Which is tor, approximately, okay? But if you work that out, then this turns out to be about 600 meters. So if that was true, if there was no time dilation effect, then these muons wouldn't be able to travel very far, right? Because they'd only get about 600 meters or so, and then they'd decay. So, of course, it's not true of all muons. Some if tor is going to be about somewhere here. Right? So, some muons do live longer, but on average, they only live for time tor. However, we can detect these muons on the Earth's surface, which is more than 10 kilometers away from where they were created. Okay? So, the reason that's possible is because of the time dilation effect. Because the muons are moving faster, they therefore decay more slowly, and therefore, it's possible for them, for them to travel all the way down to the Earth's surface. Okay. Um, so, th specifically, the experiment works like this. Um, they did an experiment in two different places. One which is at a certain height, about 2,000 meters up, I think, on top of a mountain, and one which is at sea level. Now, because the muons are coming down from the top of the atmosphere and they are decaying, you would expect more muons to be detected here and fewer muons to be detected here, right? Because they'd have more time to decay before they reach this laboratory here, okay? Now, by measuring the difference in the number of muons per unit time at this laboratory and that laboratory, you can calculate the time dilation effect, calculate the size of the time dilation.